Our, our gospel scripture reading today is Matthew 20, 1 through 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers in his vineyard. After agreeing with the workers for a standard wage, he sent them into the vineyard. When it was about nine o'clock in the morning, he went out again and saw others standing around in the marketplace without work. He said to them, go into the vineyard too, and I will give you whatever is right. So they went. And he went out again about noon, and at about three o'clock in the afternoon, he did the same. And about five o'clock in the afternoon, he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, why are you standing here all day without work? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you go and work in the vineyard too. When it was evening, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the workers and give the pay, starting with the last hired until the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each received a full day's pay. And when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more. But each one also received the standard wage. When they received it, they began to complain about the landowner, saying, these last fellows worked one hour. And you have made them equal to us who bore the hardship and burning heat of the day. The landowner replied to one of them, Friend, I am not treating you badly, unfairly. Didn't you agree with me to work for the standard wage? Take what is yours and go. I want to give this last man the same as I gave you. Am I not permitted to do what I want to what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. The first part of the 20th chapter of Matthew records this story about wages paid to workers in the vineyard. It's clearly about serving the master or working in the kingdom. But the twist here is that many of those who worked in the vineyard did not think that the wages were fairly paid. The story follows the ideas in the last chapter of of Matthew concerning wealth and the kingdom of heaven, that is, following the Lord and the cost of that discipleship. God's economy of grace is not the same as the natural order people expect. We have here a story without any additional teaching. The statements of the landowner landowner in the story therefore form the teaching that the Lord wanted us to make. After all, the landowner does represent the Lord. The story could be divided in two or three parts for an organized study. I've chosen three parts. The basic story of the hiring agreement, the twist in the story when the workers were all paid the same thing, and the landowner's explanation of what he was doing. The passage is uncomplicated. There is no citation from the Old Testament prophetic passage to be dealt with. There is no miracle in the story that has to be explained. There is no heavy theological expressions or terms that have to be studied. There is no real sin in the story that has to be confronted. Perhaps a mild complaint and dissatisfaction by the workers is all. What we are left with is a fairly normal story story with a twist to it, a lesson made out of the event. John Wesley stated that some of those who were first called may yet be last. Our Lord confirms by the following parable of which the primary scope is to show. 
that many of the Jews would be rejected and many of the Gentiles accepted the secondary, that the Gentiles, many of who were first converted, would be the, the last and lowest in the kingdom of glory, and many of those who were last converted would be first and the highest therein. I have a gentleman, Bob Swartz, was the owner of a mid-sized trucking firm. He made the decision to sell his company to a large national corporation while he was still ahead. He could see where there would be no room for a small operation like his. It was, it was grown and, ex, and expand or sell. It was grow. So he decided to sell. Each year at Christmas, Bob had given his employees and drivers a bonus which was based on the company's profits and the employee's length of time on the job. This final year of operations, however, had been a really good year. He decided to give everyone an especially generous Christmas bonus. Everyone would receive more than they had during the previous years, and everyone would receive the same amount. If you were on the payroll on December the 20th, when the checks were written, you got a bonus. When the employees first opened their envelopes, there was joy, good cheer, laughter, a jolly, jolly Christmas. Then, slowly, people began to compare checks. Hey, Joe, what did you get? You guessed it, Matthew 20, all over again. I couldn't believe it, Bob said. I tried to do something good for everybody, and now I get angry phone calls at home from people who got larger bonus checks than they ever got before. Are people that greedy? How would you answer Mr. Schwartz? Would most people you know be happy for a generous bonus they received, even when they discovered that newcomers had received the same? Or would they grumble like the people in Jesus' parable? There is no reason whatsoever to go into this passage in great detail. The grammar, the vocabulary is pretty straightforward. In fact, excellent reading of the story will provide enough color for any explanation of the meaning. But because even reading a passage requires a certain amount of interpretation, we must trace a few basic things. In order for this story to work, the imagery has to be clarified. The landowner clearly represents the Lord. The vineyard represents his kingdom. These two have been used elsewhere in Jesus' teaching with these meanings. There's no reason to ask what kind of work they were supposed to do because that is not the main thrust of the text. What is important is the apparent inequity in the pay scale. The story unfolds as the day progressed. The landowner wants to hire some men to work. He simply goes to the place where he could find such labor, a local labor pool. Even to this day, men stand around these areas in hopes they will be picked up and given a day job. In our story, the landowner made several runs to the marketplace, perhaps because the work apparently proved too much for the first two or three he hired, and perhaps because the day was spent and the work needed to be done. We cannot tell. But we can already anticipate where the story might be going. As time progresses, the Lord goes looking for more and then even more people to come and work in his vineyard with the promise of a fair wage. In the Bible, working in the vineyard is a fairly solid image of serving in the Lord's kingdom. The emphasis on wages in the outworking of the event means the story is primarily about God's gifts or rewards for faithful service. But the length of service and the amount of work done not determine what the reward is. The length of service and the amount of work does not determine what the reward is. 
After the day had came to an end, the landowner called his manager to pay the workers. But, but to everyone's surprise, he first paid the workers who came last and probably worked an hour or so. They received the pay for a full day's work. This led the other workers to think they would get more because they had been out all day. But they were wrong. They all received the same thing, a full day's wages. The landowner was certainly unconventional. Understandably, the workers who had been there all day complained to the landowner. They thought it was unfair that the men who only worked a little should get as much as they did. Most workers would think the same thing, but the landowner simply had to remind them the facts of the case. And that ended the discussion. He paid the early workers exactly what he promised, what they had agreed to. So they had no reason to complain. And since he was the landowner, he was free to offer the, the workers what he thought was fair, for they would come to work and work as well. And finally, he told the workers to take their wage and go. There was no chance of changing his mind. And nothing good would come out of them wanting to more than the other workers. For there was no law that said he had to pay them proportionately. The final point in this story says that the last will be first and the first will be last. A statement made elsewhere in the gospel. At, at the least, this statement says that the Lord cannot be held to social convention or custom in the way that he rewards people. But it certainly says that his pact with each group is fair and generous, since without it, they would have nothing. In other words, it is by grace that he rewards the workers, just as it is by grace he offered them place. Was this story prompted by the disciples' claim that they had left everything to follow Christ, implying that they deserved some kind of reward for their service? Most likely for Peter, thought that he should receive more than the rich young man would have. After all, they were the first to leave in everything and follow Christ. This lesson was apparently prompted by the event that led to the teaching on wealth and the kingdom and concluded with the same theme as the last being first. But the message here goes even further to the general call to faithful discipleship. We may form the interlocking lessons out of the answers of the landowner at the end of the story. For those represent the teaching of Jesus on reward for faithfulness. The Lord is sovereign over his kingdom. Because he is the landowner, he can pay people whatever he wants to pay them, as long as he is just. And no one here could accuse him of being unjust. He owes no man an explanation of his dealing with the workers in the vineyard. He arranged for the first workers to be paid a day's wages, and that was fair. But the other workers, he only promised a fair wage, and he certainly was more than fair. In God's kingdom, then, he is absolutely sovereign and can deal with all people in whatever way he chooses. He is free to give some people more than others in relationship to their years of service or contribution. He alone makes the decisions of what to give people for service, how to use them all day or not, and to how to reward their faithfulness. No one can challenge the decision of the sovereign Lord. Everyone who serves the Lord will be treated fairly. The workers either got what they agreed to, or they got more. 
In fact, the latter servants came to work without an exact agreement, so they were actually trusting the landowner that they would receive a fair wage. They did not have a settled agreement fixed, and because they trusted his equity, they were rewarded with the same wage that the others had worked all day for and were receiving. But they got theirs first when the owner paid the wages. This, no doubt, was designed to underscore the point that the last shall be first. How the Lord treats all of his servants is by grace. Until the workers were approached by the landowner, they had no work. If he had not found them and arranged for them to enter his vineyard, they would have remained with nothing. No one can complain that such a gracious provision is unfair unless they think that everything must be based on a legal agreement. Everyone should be thankful that God opened up the opportunity for service. The story starts out with a conventional plot hiring day workers, but it turns to the end of what is totally unconventional so that the people who worked the least got equal pay. How is that possible that the last shall be first? Not by agreement, not by contract, but by grace and grace alone. In Matthew 19.30, reminded us, with God all things are possible. And especially this work of grace, that the last is first. If God extends grace to people at the 11th hour and they respond, trusting in his goodness, they will also receive what he promised others. If God calls people into his service in his vineyard and they serve him faithfully, both the calling and reward is by grace, especially if their work was not a full day. A man named Charles was lying in a hospital bed near death. The nursing staff, the man's wife, and a couple of his children testified that Charles was not a very nice man. He drank too much, he was verbally abusive to his wife and children, and he alienated his children as well. He did, however, ask for a chaplain. The staff filled him in on how Charles on what was going on with Charles and the kind of person he was. The chaplain went into the room to visit Charles, who asked him to pray. Would you pray for me, Charles asked. What do you want me to say to God, the chaplain asked. Tell God that I am sorry for the way of my life has turned out. Tell him that I'm sorry for the way I treated my wife and my children, and that I've always really loved them. That's it? No. Tell God that I know I have no right to ask this, but I would like to be able to live with him. The chaplain prayed Charles' prayer for him. He came back the next morning to see how Charles was doing, but Charles had passed away during the night. What do you suppose? Did Charles receive the grace of God? And if he did, did he receive as much of God's love and grace as you and I after all these years of service? Here's what Jesus' story is trying to say. God is always available to anyone who reaches out whenever they reach out. God's timing is such that any time is the right time. The worker should have been pleased with what he gives them not concerned about what he gives other people. If the workers were genuinely pleased to receive work in the day's wages, they would have focused on that and not another worker's packet. It is when people start comparing what God has given to other believers that they begin to judge God's fairness. But in the final analysis, it is not by length of service or amount of work that grace operates. It is based on what 
he chooses to give. The warning to each of us is not to be proud of what we have done and expect more than those whom we think have done less. After all, if we have done more or done it longer, it is only because of his grace he made the opportunity available earlier for us. The word here drives us back to the instruction that whether he gives us a whole day or just an hour, we must serve him faithfully and trust that we will enter into the reward that he is in store for us, he has in store for us, who are faithful. That God chose any one of us for his vineyard is amazing. We should rejoice in that and rejoice in the fact that he is still inviting otherwise unemployed folks to join in. In the final analysis, this story is basically about people responding to the opportunity to work in his vineyard when the invitation is made to them. For some, the arrangements are clear. For others, they are not. But in both cases, the Lord deals justly and fairly with his people. It's not a parable about salvation, but about working in his vineyard and the rewards that will be given for faithfulness. The bottom line is that people should be ready to respond to the opportunity for service and rejoice in what he gives us as a reward for our service. He alone knows the value of each person's service in his kingdom. But we can all rest assured when the opportunity and the rewards come from the gracious Lord, they will be just and generous. Amen. The closing hymn is on 367. Join me by standing if you can. He touched me.